together. Welcome to this conference. The mic works. I prefer to stand also because I want to show you something. I have a, I have a mic that should work. Is it working? Okay, yeah. So, okay. so I prefer to stand because um, I may I want to show you something. But let me first come back. Oh, first thank Jamie Gerber for his um, elaborations. I think this uh, was a very good uh, introduction into the topic and a very serious introduction into the topic that is absolutely necessary. Uh, and I see the political perspectives exactly as he said. There is achieving Europe is a nice idea, but first of all, saving Europe is much more important. The point that I want to make has very much to do with what we discussed in the session before. Because uh, Ulrike Hermann presented, uh, uh, so to say, uh, inequality, inequality thesis about Germany, but unfortunately, without mentioning, but she explained it later because she said, I would use it. Okay, I do. Uh, but uh, without explaining that uh, the, the move towards inequality in Germany is seen as a big success. Germany has won, isn't it? Germany is the winner. And it was done by becoming more flexible, call it flexible. It was done by cutting wages, by increasing inequality through the wage negotiations on the one hand, so call it income policy, whatever you want, and through the tax, the tax system. So the, both layers of income distribution were going in the wrong direction, so to say, given the <laughs> thesis that were spread here in the first session. But unfortunately, Germany is the winner. So how could, you, how could you explain to anyone in Germany that this was exactly the wrong track? And that is why I mentioned before in my statement, short statement, how can you talk about this without talking about economics? And I think it's wrong what Professor Wilkinson said. He said, it's falsified, it's not. It's not, it's not so simple. And it is to make the whole story too simple if you say the economics are falsified, so don't talk about it. No, you have to talk about, about economics from the first to the last second if you want to change the attitude about inequality. Let me show you a simple picture, you see? I'm jumping a bit through my PowerPoint. I was in Paris last week, and there was a big discussion about the strategy for, for France to follow in the past, and in the future, given, to, given the past. This is the past, I'll explain it in a minute. And Monsieur Galois was there, you know. Monsieur Galois is the former CEO of EATS. He's now uh, in charge of uh, designing a concept for competitiveness in France. And the essence of what he said was we have to become more German. <laughs> we have to do exactly what Germany did in the years since the beginning of the monetary union. And here comes the riddle. Here comes the very simple riddle. This is Germany and France in the last 15 years. Look, the blue lines are two different measures of real wages. I don't want to go into that here. And the, the orange line is productivity in both countries. So now you tell me who was right and who was wrong. Who got it right and who got it wrong? We pretend we all know it, huh? We all know Germany got it right and France got it wrong, isn't it? <coughs> no, it's fundamentally wrong. France got it right, Germany got it wrong. <coughs> but the whole discussion, the whole discourse is just the other way around. The whole discourse is just the other way around. Because everybody says, oh, Germany has increased its competitiveness, there was globalization. You said it. Uh, uh, in, in extension of my statement, thank you very much for that. There was globalization, there was a threat from China, and I don't know what. And so it was absolutely necessary to cut wages. So this is what Germany did. It's very simple like that. Germany cut wages or did not increase wages in line with productivity, as Germany itself had done 50 years before. So it was a total break in the German politics, and it was a break towards more inequality. And nevertheless, 80% of the Germans, or 90%, I don't know what, 
and 75% of the Europeans would say in any poll that you have that Germany got it right. And if you are not able here, I'll tell you something very simple, which is very much along the lines of what James said. If you are not able here in Brussels to make, to communicate this problem, this simple problem, then Europe is lost. I agree 100% with what James said, the political dynamics of the whole thing. If you are not able to get this right, then Europe is lost. And it's, it's very simple to get it right. In a monetary union, the rule is very simple. If you have a monetary union, everybody has to adjust to its own productivity in terms of the real wage. That's the most crucial thing of all. There are problems with different levels of welfare and so on. It's not so important. The important look at France and Germany there, it's not much different in the level. I'll show it to you in a minute. The important thing is that you adjust to your own productivity and you tolerate, you accept, and you take serious the inflation target that both countries or the whole union has agreed. And this inflation target is not zero and it's not one, it's 2% or 1.9 or whatever you take. The ECB has decided 1.9. And if you have wages rising in line with productivity plus 2%, then you end up like France. If you have wages rising much less, violating the, the commonly agreed inflation target, then you end up like Europe. So now you say Germany is the winner. But the winner got it wrong. And it's very really simple to understand why Germany the winner is. Because there was a crisis. And in all the crises of the past, what happens immediately when there is a financial crisis, and this global financial crisis had immediately, uh, originally not much to do with the Euro crisis. The Euro crisis is much older than this. But what came out during the crisis, in any crisis that we had in the past, financial crisis, whatever it was in the past, suddenly the power, the balance of power, shifts from the debtor to the credit was because everybody is getting suspicious about the assets that he or she has, and they're looking more critical at the value that these assets could have. And that is, is exactly the moment when interest rates begin to rise in the, in the debtor countries, and the interest rates go down in the creditor countries. And this gives the creditor an enormous amount of power over all the rest. And this is exactly what happens what, is, what happened in Europe, and the result is a plain disaster. The result is a plain disaster. Why is it a disaster? Because Germany uses its power and uses, still uses it, uses it to tell the others that they got it wrong. Let me begin briefly at the beginning. The crucial relationship, I call it here the crucial relationship, is the relationship between unit labor cost and inflation. You see, if you, have, if you want to create a monetary union, something very simple happens. What happened in Europe, you united a number of small open economies into one big closed economy. That is what you do. And for a big closed economy, this thing is much more important than ever before, when the unit labor costs determine the inflation. We created a monetary union in Europe where everybody believed from the very first moment under the influence of Germany that the central bank determines the inflation rate is wrong. Absolutely wrong. There's no evidence for that. This is very clear. You can test it back and forth, econometrically, whatever you want. It's always stable and clear. Unit labor costs determine inflation and not the central bank. So that was the first big error. The second big error, and that has very much to do with inequality, what we discussed before, the second big error is that you believe if you move from a small open economy to a big closed economy, or to, for many small open economies to one big closed economy like the euro area is, that you can continue with the same kind of economic policy that you did in the small open economy. It's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because exports are no longer important. What counts is the internal market, is the domestic market. Your export share shrinks, 
So they say if you move from the small open economy to the big closed economy, from 30 or 40 percent that you had before to 10 percent overnight. And this is extremely important, and that is why it's absolute nonsense if now the Germans tell everybody you have to become German, because the Germans never understood that they are no member of a big closed economy. They behave as if they were still, uh, let me show you this one first, as if they were still a small open economy, and what they did is, this is the same thing, unit labor costs in Germany compared to the rest of uh, some of the European uh, member countries, Euro member countries, uh, you see the black line is the inflation target, and this is indexed in 1999. You see Germany undershot the target by a wide margin. South, Southern Europe overshot it a bit, but Germany blames the others for, for being wrong. So Germany never understood. What they did is they behaved as where they were a small open economy, and a small open economy fights for market shares in the, against the rest of the world. But for a big closed economy, economy, that's nonsense. And a small open economy can only do it successfully if they're a member of a monetary union or they have fixed exchange rate with the rest of the world, because otherwise the exchange rate would change. So there was a unique historical situation that Germany used to exploit the conditions under the monetary union and the naivete, naivete of the other members. And now everybody says, do what Germany did. Nothing could be, could be more wrong. Let me show you the thing, because some people don't believe it in absolute terms. You can calculate it in absolute terms. You see, I've calculated it for the study that I did with Kostas Lapavitsas. We did it in absolute terms. And you see, if you look at wages per hour, nominal wages per hour, you see that Germany and France started in at exactly the same level. Something like 24 euros per hour was the average wage in Germany and in France in 1999. And you see, there was no problem in France, neither in France nor in Germany, with the difference, with the, with the gap between productivity and wages. There was everywhere the same profit margin, so to say, available in both countries. And you see, even if you look now over the whole period, the gap remains the same, as I showed, have shown before, productivity, this is productivity in nominal terms, but I've shown before in real terms, so we can calculate it with the real GDP. In real terms, productivity rose exactly the same as in, in, in France, as in Germany, so there was no real problem. Where's the real problem? Monsieur Galois talked about, as a real problem, we are not productive enough. It's not true. It's just not true. It's against the facts. The only thing that happened that the nominal, the nominal values increased a bit more in France than in Germany. That is what we have seen, just the nominal values increased a bit more in France. But you see France, this is the, the orange line here, is exactly on the line of the inflation target. Exactly on the line of the inflation target. So France was the only country that got it right, everything right. Productivity and wages. And nevertheless, they're now trying desperately to become German. So I do not go into everything. I just want to talk about the adjustment process that has just started. James mentioned already we have a number of countries that have started the adjustment process. Some have not, start, not yet started the adjustment process, but are planning to start it. Here you have two of both. You have Spain and Greece. They have started the adjustment process by cutting wages. That's the adjustment that takes place. They've started the adjustment process by cutting wages. Greece quite significantly by something like 20%. Spain a little less, but they have started the adjustment towards Germany. So they have to dive down, they have to go, Mother Merkel tells them you have to come down to the blue line, you have to come down to Germany. And everybody should then come down to the blue line. <laughs> Which has a simple implication, a very simple implication. But nobody says it. The simple implication is, if everybody goes down to the blue line, the result for Europe as a whole will definitely be deflation. Deflation in the Eurozone as a whole. Absolutely clear, unavoidable, given this clear relationship. Nobody says it. You can, if you say in Europe, if you go to the capitals, you say, we have to come cheaper. 
oh, everybody would applaud you, everybody would say, if you say, we, we, are, we need defense, <coughs> would anybody, ever, anybody applaud? No, nobody. But it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. So what, what they did, these countries, some countries started to adjust. But you see, France and Italy have not yet adjusted at all. You can meet when time is running out. They have not yet adjusted at all. But what happened in the, in the countries that have adjusted already, and that is, James mentioned it before, he gave examples of that. What happened in these countries? Well, I can show you what happens if you adjust unit labor costs. You see, the orange line is GDP growth, real GDP in these countries. The blue line is unit labor costs. France, no adjustment up to now. Nevertheless, they are in recession. The whole of Europe is recession. For seven quarters now, which is close to becoming a record. Nobody talks about it. These little things, nitty-gritty, we're not, not talking about it. <laughs> then we come to a country like Italy, has not adjusted at all, but is in deeper recession already. Then we come to Portugal, more adjustment and more recession. It has adjusted quite a bit, something but very far away from Germany still, very far away from Germany. But a deep recession, then you have Spain, where we have also a bit of adjustment, and uh, you could call it depression, with something like 25% of unemployment. How should we call that? We call that a depression. And then we have the best country, the best performer. The best performer is Greece, no doubt about it. Greece has cut its wages more than any other country in Europe. That's a big achievement, or don't you think it's a big achievement? Because Germany is, yes. they're, they're becoming German. <laughs> what are you talking about? The people on the street, Jim? They're coming German. That's a painful way to become German. <coughs> no, it's plain nonsense. This all is plain nonsense. This all is plain nonsense. I have to repeat it again. Because what happens in these countries, and I give an example of how this is now realized. What happens in these countries when you cut, when you cut wages in absolute terms, what they did in these countries. The first thing that happens is not that you improve your exports, but the first thing, and James said it, is you destroy your domestic demand. In all of these countries, domestic demand has a share of 75% and uh, exports a share of 25%. So what you do, you have not yet reached, you don't reach the German curve, so you're not improving your competitiveness in absolute term. What you have to do, you're still very far away from the German curve, so the Germans are still superior to everybody, uh, every co company in, your, in your, your country, but you're destroying your domestic demand. Because if you cut wages by 20%, people cut their expenditure by 20%. What else should they do? And if they cut their expenditure by 20%, what happens? Unemployment rises. Unemployment rises. You cut wages and unemployment rises. This is very important. Because we are told that it's the other way around. You cut wages and you reduce unemployment. It's wrong. You cut wages and you increase unemployment. And this is now, and this is sensational, nobody has realized it, but it's sensational and it's there. This has now been acknowledged by the IMF. Can you believe it? The IMF said in a letter that stated the state of the art of adjustment in Spain, they obviously realized, oh, falling wages leads to rising unemployment. So the IMF recommends for Spain, it's no joke, to turn to a planned economy, socialism. Namely, what they say is, the IMF says, we need a commitment, we now need in Spain, after we have done all this nonsense, we need now a commitment in Spain that further wage cuts are directly compensated by an increase in employment by the employers. A commitment by the, from the employer side can you imagine? So the employer cuts wages by 10%. It commits, every good employer commits to increase the employment by 10%. No good, I can tell you, no good German, here's a German union leader, not a leader, but uh, someone close to the leaders. No German union leader would ever dare to ask for something like that. They do it maybe on a company level, sometimes very carefully and very cautiously. But on the, for the whole economy, nobody would ask for something like that because everybody 
They're sure the, the, the employers will tell them you're crazy, that's socialism. Now the IMF asks for exactly that. Yeah, that's wonderful, it's true. Whoever wants to have it, look at my blog at the internet, Plastic Economics, you will find it today. Today is there, an article about it. Yeah. So what are we doing now? Where are we going from here? No way, no way out. There's only a way into disaster. I'm shying away from showing this again because I've shown it so often. But the only way, the simple solution is you, have, you, need, you need causal treatment. Whenever you want to treat something uh, right, you have to do it a causal treatment. James was right in saying you need treatment at the emergency station. You need to stabilize the patient. But in the end, you need causal treatment. You have to give these countries back their competitiveness. But you cannot give it back by cutting wages or what some foolish people, I must say, call internal devaluation. There's no such thing as internal devaluation as uh, just to fool, fool other people. You have to do, the blue line has to go up. Germany has to increase its wages, and Germany has to increase its domestic demand. There's no other way than under the sun. You have to stabilize the patient by monetary policy, by fiscal policy, by stopping austerity immediately, by immediately stopping this foolish fiscal austerity policy. But the important, the crucial thing in the long term is that the countries can regain competitiveness without destroying their economy. And the only way to do this is this way. And that brings me back to, and that, I can end on that. That brings me back to what I said before. What is, what is the most important, what is the most important instrument, so to say, or the most important mechanism you have for a large, rather closed economy to be successful? What is the most important instrument? I can tell you, it's very simple. That's part of a book that I have just published in German with, with James and some other economists. The most important thing is that you have wages, real wages, rising in line with productivity. That is exactly what France has done. Real wages rising in line with productivity is the only way to have sustainable, not to talk about ecological things now, that's a different question, but to have an economically sustainable growth of the long term. And this rule of a big closed economy you have to learn in Europe. Either we're learning it now or we'll learn it never. Thank you very much.